a window because that is going to be streamed live. And we would ask your organization, if your organization is, put a box up and put the uh, a channel up so people can watch it all over. And that way we can get the information out of all the organizations that are doing the work around these issues. <coughs> but if you go to the KPFA uh, website, you'll be able to get this. And if you go to the conference, Helen Caldecott, you'll get the information. So, uh, okay, we're, we're, we don't have a lot of time, but we have some presentations of some activists and others who are, are going to talk about some of the work that they're doing. And uh, first up is Ruthie Sackheim, and she's with Occupy San Francisco Environmental Justice. So, welcome, Ruthie. Hi, everybody. Thanks. This is the first I've heard of it. I work in two groups for Occupy. One is the Occupy Forum, which is a speaker series, and the second is the um, Environmental Justice Working Group. And the Environmental Justice Working Group is coalition with a bunch of other groups working against nuclear power, mainly Steve, and that group, No Nukes Action, and um, we've been involved in a number of demonstrations together. In the beginning, when we had a lot of people, we had a big demonstration at uh, that walked from the Japanese consulate in a march to PG&E um, to protest there. And we had a lot of singers, and we had a lot of speakers, and we had people from Tri-Valley Cares, and we've been doing that kind of work. Um, we've also been to TUC together um, to work against San Jose and the f passing the money that it cost them to repair their horrible mistakes onto the ratepayers. Um, so that's some of what environmental justice does. We also work against fracking and a lot of other things in other areas. And then in um, the forum, we have a speaker series, and we've had Cecile Pineda come speak to us about her book, um, Doing the Fukushima Step by Step, and other people come speak to us. And so we're doing a lot of outreach and education with the public. And I think Occupy did a really good job for the first year bringing to light a lot of these issues that the regulatory agencies don't regulate, and the banks keep funding the companies that are doing these things, and et cetera, et cetera. And then I think we were probably infiltrated in a lot of the violence stuff that came up, that whole mission thing was not Occupy people, it was other people and that Occupy then got blamed for. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so, so we're regrouping. Um, the forum is right now working on a strategy series um, we all saw the movie Heist, and we've read about the conservative plot to, you know, basically put people in the schools, um, put people in the courts, on every level, on municipal level, state level, federal level, to basically infiltrate the whole society with their agenda, and now we're talking about how are we going to take back our society, take back our democracy. Um, and that series is going to start in April. First, it's going to be with all the other Occupy groups that are still there. Everybody's under, underground a bit, but everybody's still working incredibly hard, and everyone's online emailing each other all the time and plotting and planning and educating. Um, and when we have that series, we're going to talk about short-term goals, medium-term goals, and long-term goals, meaning like one-year, five-year, ten-year goals, to stop all of this stuff. because. The money in politics is one of the main causes of this, but we don't want to get caught in the same old track of just standing outside somewhere with a picket sign, endlessly petitioning Obama, and all kinds of other things that don't work, frankly, that just don't seem to work, especially not without critical mass with the, with the population coming out en masse and protesting together. So we're investigating a lot of tactics of other movements that have worked, like the anti-apartheid movement uh, really worked, and there were other things. The civil rights movement had a lot of a lot of success, and so we're studying all of that, how they did it. Not just um, you know, it wasn't just Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. It was incredible the levels of planning and background that went on before that. And we have people from those various movements coming and speak to uh, speaking to our group and telling us how they actually did it. A huge help. So if you guys want to come to Occupy Forum, it's held at Global Exchange. It's every Monday night. We had amazing speakers so far and continue. And if you want to get on there, you can come to me afterwards and give me your, your email. Did you have a URL that people We don't. We're really clumsy. But, but if you give me your um, email address, I send out a lot of stuff every week. So at least especially about those speakers. Okay. Our next... Oh. 
is how I found out about this. Great. Yeah. Okay, very good. It works. Our right. next speaker is Fiji Ann Thomas Sogan, and she's with uh, Fukushima Response. She's one of the endorsers of the conference and also a contributor. So welcome, Fiji. Thank you. I'm Phoebe Sorgan of Fukushima Response Bay Area. There's also a Fukushima Response Northern California in Sonoma. I have a few people here from, from there. And um, Fukushima Response Bay Area, the steering committee is Nick Babbitt. Raise your hand, Nick, please. Uh, Holly Harwood and Carol Wollman and I. And so um, I wonder, Holly, if you might pass the clipboards around um, so people won't have to make their way to the back table, although I recommend it. <laughs> so we have two clipboards, and one is for individual members of our organization or people who would like to be informed of our work. And the other is for organizational endorsements of our nominators later, about which I'll get to um, later, the nominators letter. So um, what we do, um, we have hosted Yastel Yamada twice, who was a manager at Fukushima and who founded the Skilled Veterans Corps at Fukushima, which is almost 700 elderly former nuclear workers and nuclear engineers who want to go in there and clean it up and prevent the young people from having to go whose, whose lives and health health will be more adversely affected than older people, um, assuming that it may take 20 years or more to come down with cancer and so forth. So um, that was mentioned earlier, and he's, he's doing good work, and his organization is. So we brought him to the US twice, and he did cross-country tours of college campuses and, and other places. Um, we also have been demonstrating on Friday evenings in solidarity with the thousands of people, the unprecedented numbers of Japanese who've been taken to the streets of Tokyo on Fridays. And we wear hazmat suits when we do that, and you can see those back there. So that gets attention and it's kind of fun. Um, and we've been moving around, uh, sometimes in San Francisco, more often in the East Bay. I think now that we have daylight savings time, we're, the, the current plan is that we will continue this um, from 5 to 6 p.m. on Friday evenings at the downtown Berkeley Bard Station. Um, from there, we, we might move elsewhere depending on turnout and depending on what other plans people have for that Friday evening. But um, if we settle on a regular place and time, then, then we, that will build. So um, come with us. We have extra hazmat suits. And so if you get there from 5 to 5.30, we'll still be at the downtown um, Berkeley BART station. And you can find out where we go from there and join us if you'd like. Um, the third thing that we've been doing um, is we're trying to be a catalyst to establish an international team of independent experts to solve the problem at Fukushima as best as it can be solved. And of course, there, there are many problems there. And foremost in a lot of people's minds is the Unit 4 spent fuel pools as well as other spent fuel pools there, um, Unit 3, possibly 2, and, and the collective fuel pool, um, getting those fuel rods removed into dry cask storage if that's deemed to be the, the best thing. Um, meanwhile, stabilizing it, possibly also getting radiological firefighting equipment and materials in place in case it comes to that. Because as many of you know, Arnie Gunderson and Helen Caldicott have both said that should that fuel pool at Unit 4 collapse, they plan to get their loved ones evacuated to the southern hemisphere um, right away. And so we, um, that, that is an, an extreme scenario that we want to do everything in our power to prevent. And um, we don't feel that TEPCO and the Japanese government are adequately addressing it now. And so the, we're, we're pleased to have um, Dale Breidenbau, and we would love to have you 2K on, on our nominator team to, um, in, to nominate experts that you think are qualified and also are people of ethics and conscience to, um, you're right, to, 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 and which is largely going to be whistleblowers probably, um, who have the courage to forge ahead and determine what the best plan of action is or they may determine that um, that we can't get adequate information um, to to forge forward with a, an alternative plan, but they could then critique the IAT plan, the 
international advisory team that TEPCO and the Japanese government are, are putting um, forth, which is probably going to be industry sponsored and um, and we hope their primary job won't be PR for the nuclear industry rather than public safety. So I'd like to spend the rest of my time, um, I'd like to direct you to the table back there where there's a lot of material, including um, a half sheet flyer with suggestions for um, ways to protect yourself and your family from nuclear contamination, um, which is here. It's coming over on the jet stream and on the Pacific. Um, and there will be some health effects, and of course it could get a lot worse. So there are a lot of things we can do. There's a flyer back there um, that looks like this. And I'd like to spend the rest of um, the time doing a, a mobilizing energy exercise, because we feel that um, psychic numbing is one of the greatest problems facing that, and it's probably why this is not standing room only today. And this was developed by Carol Woolman, who is a Harvard-educated doctor and a psychiatrist. Um, and you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the work of Joanna Macy at Calorine Psychic Numbing. So um, I'm just going to ask you, um, this is one of, the, yeah, one of the biggest challenges we face. Most people don't want to think about a problem of this magnitude. So this exercise is designed to wake us up and, design, and, and mobilize energy. Now you here are already awake. But you can use this exercise with other groups to wake other people up. So I'm going to ask you to take a few deep breaths. Um, maybe wiggle around a little bit. Swing your arms if you want. If you want, stand up and jump up and down. Or take a good stretch. And just get in touch with your body um, for a moment. And then now ask yourself what you're feeling about what you've heard today and over the last year about the nuclear dangers that we're all facing. And um, as you breathe into your gut, allow yourself to feel the emotions. And if you feel it, speak it out or shout out the feelings that you're feeling about um, this heist that's been pulled over the people of the world. Um, how, how do you feel about the nuclear dangers that we're all facing? Disgusted. Horrified. Scared. Angry. Irate. Frustrated. Scared and sad. Okay. Um, okay, next. Consider this. Radiation impacts the DNA, which is the very stuff of life. DNA programs us to choose life, to preserve life. It's what makes us who we are as unique individuals. It impels us to reproduce when we're young and to pass on the DNA to the next generations. It's what we have in common with all other life forms. Radioactive tuna, mutant butterflies, high rates of thyroid nodules among Japanese children, all point to lots of deaths and health problems from nuclear dangers and their impact on DNA. Now, Ask your DNA what to do about Fukushima Daiichi and about nuclear dangers in general. Just take a moment, moment of silence, and ask your DNA. Shut it down. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Go to work. Yeah. Good. What talents can you use? Breathe deeply into every cell of your body and ask your DNA again what to do. <coughs> we must communicate and work together if we're going to solve this. There's a social taboo against discussing the nuclear threat. The culture of the nuclear village is designed to protect the future of nuclear energy and portray it as safe. And we have to break that social and media blackout. So next I'm going to ask you to pair off, just for one, one two minutes. Turn to your neighbor and, um, yeah, just pair off and spend 30 seconds each. I'll say the person with longer hair goes first. 
uh, so you don't have to spend your whole 30 seconds deciding who goes first. So tell your neighbor what your DNA said. Share it. I'll tell you when 30 seconds is up. <laughs> My DNA says put in some shrink beans <laughs> really fast. <laughs> okay, that's 30 seconds. Switch, switch partners. <laughs> I asked for this a few years back. <laughs> okay, that's it. End of exercise. Thank you very much. Three. Yeah. So now I, I will ask you to hold that in your heart, what your DNA told you, and take it further. Resolve to warn your friends and family and acquaintances about nuclear dangers. Now think about the timeline. How much time do we have to take care of Fukushima Daiichi and the 400 plus other nuclear power plants across the, Western, the northern hemisphere? Think about your life priorities. Should you reorder your life priorities given the threat that we're all facing in light of what you've heard today and what's come to you? This is a tough subject. How can we work on it and stay positive? Now, didn't that feel good? Just sharing and facing the fear or facing whatever it is and thinking about solutions. So think of it as pure energy converting the negative to the positive by cherishing the truth and opening our hearts, loving ourselves, loving our lives, loving each other, the whales, the polar bears, the grandchildren. Use the energy positively to build networks and to support each other. There are a number of networks here and it's all good. We have different tactics, we have different strategies and it's all good, we need to support each other. Use our breath to purify the fear energy and turn it into light. So, thank you so much for being here today. You are the people that I want to be with. You're the people I want to network with. You're the people who can be with in life. Thanks to God is for Occupy, and for the people who take to the streets. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. It's going to take all of that. It's going to take escalating protests and eventually strikes. And we are the people. We have the power. Okay, thank you. Next big one. You had one body count. I'm sure it was many, many years at the California Public Utility Commission to push for alternative energy. And had a very important role that she's played uh, in fighting for that because. California, like Japan, has sunlight and can have alternative energy, but, but because of the utility industry, the new good operators, they're not interested. So welcome to <laughs> Harvard. Steve asked me to, to speak um, last night, actually, and um, I, I understand that Donna Gilmore was going to, was hoping to come up. Um, uh, Donna Gilmore is in uh, San Clemente, and she runs a website called SanOnofreSafety.org. Um, please write that down, and that's the place to go for all the information on uh, the San Onofre issues. So that's what Steve asked me to give you an update on San Onofre. Um, we have a pretty wonderful piece of news. The um, Mitsubishi um, report was finally released yesterday, of course, on Friday afternoon after the news media went home. And uh, this is a report that everybody's been waiting for. It was. It was leaked to the Friends of the Earth by a whistleblower, and it, it's the Mitsubishi uh, report on the root cause of the problems at, at San Onofre. And uh, is, read the LA Times articles, the Reuters articles, they're really, really 
really wonderful quotes. And my, my favorite piece was, um, as for the code error, the, the report said Mitsubishi had used an inappropriate definition of the gap between tubes in its calculations. In other words, they couldn't count, you know, how close the tubes are together. Because that's what was happening is the tubes were rub rubbing against each other and against the support plates. Um, and of course, Edison's response was, oh, we didn't know. You know, basically this report says that, that um, Edison and Mitsubishi both knew um, before the steam generators were even installed that they had a problem. In fact, it goes back to 2005, and in fact it actually goes back earlier than that because there is another document leaked by whistleblowers, thank God for leaking whistleblowers, to Arne Gunderson. And this is um, the specifications that Edison um, put out for the um, for the job for to for Mitsubishi to do, and they basically said, um, whatever you do, you have to do it within this 50-59 um, parameters. And 50-59 means that it's it does not need a license amendment review, um, which of course it should have had. This is what Friends of the Earth has been fighting for. That should have had a, a license amendment review, and certainly should have one now before. And they even talk about restarting it. Um, but um, it, from the report, this is a quote from the report, um, they actually considered design changes back in 2005. That's the discussion in the report. And the anti-vibration team, the anti-vibration bar, this is, you know, because the vibration of the tubes inside the steam generators is what caused the problem. And that was caused in turn by the steam being hotter and drier than it was supposed to be. Um, but each of the considered changes had unacceptable consequences, and the anti-vibration bar team, design team agreed not to implement them. Among the difficulties associated with this is important to note, the only one that they mention is uh, among the difficulties associated with the potential changes was the possibility that making them could impede the ability to justify the, re the replacement steam generator design under the provisions of 10 CFR 1559. So the, this is a bombshell, and it, okay, 5059 is a piece of the NRC code, and Nuclear Regulatory Commission code, and uh, it it says if you have a like for like replacement, in other words, if you're not going to do anything different, if you're going to put steam generators in that are basically the same as what you had before, that's fine. We're not going to do a license amendment review, which would among other things, require a, an evidentiary hearing um, and a lot closer look at it. And actually, Dawn and I were talking this morning. We think that they have laid the groundwork for this uh, for several years before the steam generator um, uh, case at the at the CPUC, which was in 2004 and 2005, uh, because they actually applied for an upgrade. In other words, they applied for the to be able to run the, the nuke hotter and faster uh, back in 2001. And that was when they still had the old steam generators. And you know when they were <coughs> getting ready to, to apply for, the, for these new steam generators, they already probably knew that they had a problem. And Edison owns a piece of Palo Verde nuke in uh, Arizona. And they were actually going through a license amendment review with the Palo Verde steam generator oh. replacement. So they knew um, very much what what the review consisted of, and they just didn't want to bother. And, and they had to stuff these steam generators into the same space, so they couldn't make any, them any bigger, but they wanted to run it faster so they could make more money. And I mean, it, it, it's, it's a pretty amazing story. Uh, but Steve wanted me to keep it for 10 minutes, so I have five left. And uh, I wanted to, to um, just let you guys know um, what is going on in the CPUC. I am not working for the CPUC. I'm um, an intervener, uh, and that's not just me. My organization is called Women's Energy Matters. And um, I've actually trained in about eight, um, nine other parties to be in CPUC cases. And I also trained a bunch of people to work with me. And I have a team right now that is working um, in this proceeding uh, and in other proceedings. But I am really interested in having more people um, that can help to crunch some of these documents. Um, we have received 
the, um, the original 2003 specifications um, report. Um, obviously now we have the, uh, the Mitsubishi report. Uh, and then there's another, uh, a bunch of other things that I'm very interested in doing. Um, California um, reactors obviously have a big problem with earthquakes, but the emergency response uh, planning for the, the nuclear power plants in California, like the rest of the country, do not consider the effect of earthquakes in emergency planning at all. And that is um, <clears throat> kind of an amazing oversight. And we have a wonderful leaked hearing that I got from um, the Avalon Clearinghouse, uh, Roger Harride, uh, that, that is uh, kind of hysterical. You know, I, I think these two things are funny, but the old, the old um, uh, chair of the, of the NRC at the time, 1984, this is, uh, this is actually emergency response closed hearings, in other words, secret hearings that were held on Diablo Canyon, and they, um, but they, they, refer, they referred to the San Onofre case, which had, had gone through a little bit earlier, and they said, well, here's why we are not going to consider earthquakes in emergency planning. Um, and the, the chair goes, well, earthquakes are no worse than fog or whatever. <laughs> And there are, there are other um, things that are absolutely, you just cannot believe that this is the NRC talking. Um, one of the things that I really want people to, to put out there as a goal <coughs> to be working towards is break the preemption uh, for safety that the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, has. Um, California has a bunch of safety issues that we can kind of nibble around to the edges, but we are not allowed to actually address the safety of, of the operations of nuclear power plants. Um, however, one, one thing that we can do is talk about these emergency response um, documents that, that um, Edison is producing. And I put in a bunch of data requests that are, you know, coming back with some pretty juicy stuff. Uh, and uh, you know, amongst them, you know, here here's all the information that they're giving to schools. Um, what is our education program in the schools like? Well, well, they have lots of nice you know, field trips for the kids to come in and you know meet the engineers and you know. And then there's a there's a philanthropy um, section, which is in addition to the overall company philanthropy. This is just particularly the nuclear philanthropy. Um, that goes out in every chamber of commerce, um, all sorts of community organizations. And in this proceeding, um, the investigation of San Onofre, we have a number of um, minority um, uh, representative groups, Asian Americans and Hispanics, and they are looking for money to distribute this literature that Edison is, is um, putting out. So that is actually, a, you know, part of the scope of the case is the emergency response, um, you know, education information. So basically that gives us an opening to take on what I call nuke speak. There was a great book called Nuke Speak, which talks about the, the propaganda um, campaigns for nuclear um, energy and, and weapons. And uh, so we can we could certainly go through these materials and look at the you know the truthfulness of them and say I mean it's all it's all about the money at the CPUC it's like should Edison get the money to produce this should they get the money to restart the plan should all the money be refunded this is the basics of the case um, and we are working on that and, and Roger has put together an incredible slideshow on emergency response which should, I just got a peak preview of the other day which is totally amazing. Um, and then as Steve mentioned, um, the issue that I um, focus on in all of my cases of the CPUC are the um, energy efficiency opportunities and the, and the uh, renewable energy um, and uh, you know, uh, we, we have wonderful testimony from, from the last couple of years for the procurement cases at the CPC. Uh, and you might not know that the utilities currently do not count the solar power that you paid for to put on your roof. It's not counted as part of the system. The energy efficiency that they are spending a billion dollars a year to help you install, that is not counted in their system. And why? We don't know where it is. That's what PG&E said. We, you know, could be anywhere in the territory. So how, how do we know? And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Supermarkets are counting heads of lettuce. 
you should be able to count you know, the, <laughs> the improvements that you've made on, this, on energy efficiency. And you certainly should be able to count the solar um, power that you, after all, have to hook up on the roof. So very grudgingly, the um, decision in the procurement case this um, um, just just last month or two months yeah last month early February um, said that they are the, the independent system operator the grid operator and the utility are going to have to get together and figure out how to use this stuff and I'm saying why should we leave it to ISO and and Edison the two really? parties in the case who least wanted to use this. Why don't the rest of us um, get involved? Because there were a lot of, of um, clean energy parties in the case. And so I've actually had a, a proposal into the CPC ever since May of 2011, right after Fukushima. I said, look, California nukes could go down at any moment, um, God forbid, but with an accident. And what California needs to do more than anything is to figure out a, a clean replacement resources for these nukes. And so it's taken a couple years now, but um, you know, at least you know, grumpy as they are, uh, they are they are looking at it. So I, I would love it if um, people would like to call me and uh, get involved, um, or you can go on. You can go on and look at our site. It hasn't been updated like Donna's had, but womensenergymatters.org. You can you can reach me through that website. And uh, I look forward to speaking with all of you, and I'm so grateful that you're all here today. Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least, we have uh, Dan Berman. Uh, Dan Berman is a uh, uh, expert on health and safety, and, and wrote a book on death on the job about the cost shifting for health and safety of injured workers. And he's also a, written a book, another book, which is very important for all of us here. It's called Who Owns the Sun. Huh. Who Owns the Sun. So everybody should take that down and get a copy if you can on on Amazon, because that book actually explains why we don't have alternative energy. But we have this great sun every day <laughs> blasting all this energy on the world. So, and uh, Dan, you want to speak? I also want to say Dan Berman is, that book is the reason why I do the work I've been doing for the last oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> It's always nice to hear that someone reads it. <laughs> um, in any case, it takes, I'm very slow, and I'm trying to do another version of this Death on the Job book, and I'm, I'm a little bit stalled, but I'll finish it, hopefully before, you know, well, well I'm still alive. <laughs> in any case, uh, what I wanted to talk about, and I, 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 I met this, we, we all met this, this uh, wonderful person, Becky McLean, who, and, and she just absolutely blew my mind. She gave a, 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 a presentation on April 28, 2009 on, um, on whistleblowing and uh, molecular biology and stem cell research uh, outside some, some building on, on, um, on 3rd Street in Mission in, Bay. In Mission Bay, Bay. Mission yeah. Bay. <laughs> Yeah, that, that huge that huge complex a lot of that's devoted to molecular biology, and uh, what she, what's happened to her is she uh, she's an expert in, in stem cell technologies, working at Fi was working at Pfizer in Groton, Connecticut, and uh, she was on the safety committee at, at the uh, at, at at the institution there. And uh, she started uh, you know noticing some problems there. For instance, they there were cases of some of these retroviruses were uh, showing up on uh, when they were eating, and uh, she, you know, and and she she uh, she would every time there'd be some kind of a, 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 a safety problem, she documented, you know, at the committee meetings, and uh, after a while, people start the company started getting very irritated with her. Uh, she could she couldn't get them to uh, correct any conditions, and uh, at, at one time she finally decided to write a letter to management and said, uh, "Could you please explain the safety budget at Pfizer, which is the company's biggest, uh, which is the country's uh, l uh, largest uh, uh, pharmaceutical company, maybe the world's largest? Uh, 
how you deal with these unnecessary risks you put people through. And, and the, the environmental uh, health and safety manager responded, well, this is how it's run. Pfizer's safety budget is based on what is legal, not necessarily what is safe. <laughs> and so, uh, so in any case, you know, one thing led to another. They, for a while, uh, a lot of people were suffering headaches, they were vomiting at work, and they figured out that uh, the, the hood leading away from one of the uh, uh, research areas where they were carrying out research on embryonic stem cells was just kind of sucking the air from one part of the, the lab and kind of releasing it <laughs> somewhere else. So they, they decided to, to remedy that by just pumping the stuff out, outside into, into the, broaden, the local broaden air. And, uh, you know, then she started getting sick. She would get uh, 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 nauseous, or she, she'd be half paralyzed for a few days, and she thought this must have something to do with what, what she's re, uh, working with. So she goes, uh, she, she, she asks, you know, she, in, a, in, a, in a nice way, she asks, what am I exposed to? Which you're supposed to have a right to know this under, under the OSHA Act. In fact, you know, they have the regular uh, OSHA poster, you have a right to a safe and healthful workplace. It's the law. Uh, and that's in every, just about every workplace. It's supposed to be there. And so she, uh, she, she tried to find out what she was actually exposed to. She figured it was one of these retroviruses. And um, uh, they said, well, um, she was told uh, uh, it, it might have been a, a lenti virus, but it was a, a virus that was taken from monkeys, so it wouldn't affect her. And the next day, the, the guy came back and said, oh, it's safe. Uh, it, no, I think it was a mouse virus, not a human virus. Don't worry. And so they, they, they disinfected the place. But in any case, she still couldn't find out the exact, uh, the exact virus she was exposed to. And as she explains, has explained that there's no such thing as, you know, a virus.